Hey guys, if you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's simply the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor by Spotify has everything you need all in one place. So let me explain. Now, Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your own cell phone or your own computer. Now, I've been using and loving Anchor by Spotify for two years now. And don't forget that Anchor will go ahead and distribute your podcast on so many listening platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts and so many, many more. Now, I think it's simply everything you need to make your own podcast all in one place. And don't forget, Anchor is totally free. So why don't you go ahead and download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. I can't wait to hear all of your podcasts. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. To all my listeners, now I hope you're all having a great day so far. I know I am. And if it's your first time finding me, thanks so much and welcome. This is episode number four of my seventh season. Today is Wednesday, September 28th, 2022. My name is Sonal Patel and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. Now it's already the start of fall. The autumn season is here and I think you can hear it in my voice. It's my very favorite season. I love these colors that are going to be changing soon. Those cozy sweaters, the chunky scarves, the boots. Oh my God, I can't wait to pull out all my boots. This is going to be so much fun. Of course, I love those warm drinks, that apple cider, mulled cider that you get at the local pumpkin farms. Can't wait to go see those. Go apple picking. So exciting. And of course, it's college football season, my very, very favorite. Go Buckeyes, go. And I cannot wait for Halloween. I love to be spooked. Love it, love it, love it. So I got to find those podcasts on true crime and murders and all that good stuff. I'm so excited. The scarier they are, I'm so happy. All right, you guys. Now, I just wanted to thank all of my listeners out there because it's all of you that keep pushing my little podcast into the top Apple podcast charts month after month. And I just can't believe seeing these numbers. It's just so incredible. You guys also keep me in Feedspot's top 15 medical billing and coding podcasts. I'm right now at number three. So I hope to hang in that spot for at least a little while longer. But like I've said, I've been in the top 15 for these past two years of my podcast. So I'm very, very happy. And also worldwide, the countries that are tuning in are just growing and growing. I see all of you out there and I wanted to thank all of you. I'm truly humbled and ever so grateful for all of your continued support. It's because of all of you that I can keep going strong week after week. Now, all right, you guys, I've got so much to get into today, right? It's the last Wednesday of the month, so you know it's going to be packed. So I'm going to be diving into my compliance tips and my compliance recommendations today on the new hot off the press CBR just being mailed out for cataract surgery. And hey, hey, you know, it's my favorite month end episode where I discuss highlights from the month of September's criminal and civil enforcement cases involving fraud, waste and abuse. And I go ahead and round out today's episode with the remarkable quote on purpose and impact by Jane Goodall. If you guys have checked me out on LinkedIn, you know I'm all about compliance and protecting our physicians and our valued healthcare professionals when it comes to the business of medicine. I hope this week with me brings you enough to take back to your organizations to want to dive in deeper, to use my tips and best practices to ensure success. I hope this podcast will help you boost the quality of documentation capture and improve coding accuracy as you help all of your providers paint the medical picture. If you like what you're hearing, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button now 
so you don't miss another episode, please write in a review and kindly drop me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to my podcast. I'd really love your support. And as always, a friendly disclaimer. Remember, I'm bringing you the news, current healthcare industry news, my compliance tips and my recommendations based on my over 12 years of experience in front office, in back end, in coding, and in billing for multi-specialty physicians, in compliance, and in auditing for both ENM and surgical operative reports. These are my opinions alone and are not to be construed as legal advice. So let's get into newsworthy. The month's fraud, waste, and abuse cases. The month of September saw a whopping 46 cases as of the recording of this episode. Early September saw a manufacturer of durable medical equipment, DME, agreeing to pay over $24 million to resolve False Claims Act allegations that it misled federal health care programs by paying kickbacks to DME suppliers. The settlement resolves allegations that the DME manufacturer caused DME suppliers to submit claims for ventilators, oxygen concentrators, CPAP, and BiPAP machines, and other respiratory-related medical equipment that were false because the manufacturer provided illegal inducements to the DME suppliers. The DME manufacturer allegedly gave the DME suppliers physicians prescribing data free of charge that could assist their marketing efforts to physicians. Special Agent in Charge for the Department of Health and Human Services, Office of the Inspector General, the HHS OIG, stated, quote, by paying kickbacks to obtain patient referrals, DME manufacturers are prioritizing financial incentives over patient needs, which undermines the integrity of federal health care programs, end quote. She later stated, quote, HHS OIG will continue to work tirelessly with our law enforcement partners to prevent such waste of valuable taxpayer dollars, end quote. The anti-kickback statute prohibits the knowing and willful payment of any remuneration to induce the referral of services or items that are paid for by a federal health care program, such as Medicare, Medicaid, or TRICARE. Claims submitted to these programs in violation of the anti-kickback statute give rise to liability under the False Claims Act. The settlement provides that the DME manufacturer will pay over $22 million to the United States, and in addition will pay over $2 million to the various states as a result of the impact of the DME manufacturer's alleged conduct on their Medicaid programs. In addition to the civil settlement, the DME manufacturer entered into a five-year Corporate Integrity Agreement, or CIA, with the HHS OIG. The CIA requires the DME manufacturer to implement and maintain a robust compliance program that includes, among other things, review of arrangements with referral sources and monitoring of its sales force. The CIA also requires the DME manufacturer to retain an independent monitor, selected by the OIG to assess the effectiveness of its compliance systems. Early September also saw a federal jury convicting the president of a medical technology company for allegedly participating in a scheme to mislead investors, commit healthcare fraud, and pay illegal kickbacks in connection with the submission of over $77 million worth of false and fraudulent claims for COVID-19 and allergy testing. It is alleged that this man engaged in a scheme to defraud the medical technology company's investors by claiming that he himself had invented revolutionary technology to test for virtually any disease using only a few drops of blood. In meeting with investors, this man and his publicist claimed that he was the, quote, father of the microarray technology, end quote, and falsely stated that he was on the shortlist for the Nobel Prize. The evidence at trial showed that this president of the medical technology company also falsely represented to investors that it could be valued at $4.5 billion based on purported revenues of $80 million per year. 
As part of this scheme, the evidence at trial showed that this man failed to release the company's SEC required financial disclosures and concealed that the company was allegedly on the verge of bankruptcy. He allegedly manipulated the investors who were concerned that the company was a scam by inviting them to private meetings and issuing false press releases and tweets stating that the company had just entered into lucrative partnerships with companies, government agencies, and public institutions, including a children's hospital and a major health care provider. The tweets and press releases falsely claimed that such entities had agreed to use the company technology when, in fact, no such agreements existed or were of minimal value. He also allegedly orchestrated an illegal kickback and health care fraud scheme that involved submitting fraudulent claims to Medicare and private insurance for unnecessary allergy testing. The company allegedly ran allergy screening tests on every patient for 120 different allergens, ranging from hornet stings to codfish, regardless of medical necessity. The evidence at trial showed that the company billed more per patient to Medicare for blood-based allergy testing than any other laboratory in the United States, and that the company also billed some commercial insurers over $10,000 per test. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and stay-at-home orders reducing the demand for allergy testing back in 2020, he then falsely announced that the company had a test for COVID-19 based on the company's blood testing technology before developing such a test. Seeking to capitalize on the nationwide shortage of COVID-19 testing, he then orchestrated a deceptive marketing scheme that falsely claimed that Dr. Anthony Fauci and other prominent government officials had mandated testing for COVID-19 and allergies at the same time and required that patients receiving the company's COVID-19 test also be tested for allergies. He allegedly also falsely claimed that the company's COVID-19 test was more accurate than a PCR test for diagnosing COVID-19 infections while concealing from investors and patients taking the test that the Food and Drug Administration had informed him that the company's test was not accurate enough to receive an emergency use authorization, an EUA, for use in the United States. This man was convicted of one count of conspiracy to commit health care fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud, two counts of health care fraud, one count of conspiracy to pay kickbacks, two counts of payment of kickbacks, and three counts of securities fraud. He is scheduled to be sentenced and faces a maximum penalty of 20 years, imprisonment for the conspiracy to commit health care fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. 10 years of imprisonment for each count of healthcare fraud, five years imprisonment for conspiracy to pay kickbacks, 10 years imprisonment for each count of payment of kickbacks, and 20 years imprisonment for each count of securities fraud. Early September also saw a plastic surgeon agreeing to pay $800,000 to resolve allegations of inappropriate billing and false claims. Here, it is alleged that the plastic surgeon wrongfully billed Medicare and Medicaid for services rendered by others and billed Medicare for medically unnecessary and unreasonable applications of skin substitute products. Specifically, the government alleged that from the years 2013 to 2020, he submitted inappropriate claims for payment to government health care programs in three ways. First, the government alleged that the plastic surgeon submitted claims to Medicare and Medicaid in his own name, when in fact the services were rendered by auxiliary personnel, even when there was insufficient physician involvement for the claims to be billed in this plastic surgeon's name. Second, the government alleged that he submitted claims to Medicare and Medicaid in his own name, when in fact the services were rendered by medical fellows without himself as the teaching physician being physically present. And finally, third, the government alleged that he submitted claims to Medicare for medically unnecessary and unreasonable applications of skin substitute products. Mid-September saw a physician 
pleading guilty to federal drug trafficking violations. This family practice physician pleaded guilty to conspiracy to distribute and dispense controlled substances and health care fraud. According to information presented in court beginning in 2017, this licensed physician operated a family medicine practice and unlawfully prescribed approximately 370,000 dosage units of hydrocodone outside the usual course of professional practice and without a legitimate medical purpose. An investigation began after it was reported that he was allegedly pre-signing opioid prescriptions for patients that were exhibiting drug-seeking behavior. He would allegedly pre-sign these prescriptions and the patients would be seen by his four nurse practitioners. The investigation revealed patients were repeatedly able to obtain the strongest prescription for hydrocodone from him and one of the nurses without ever being fully examined or providing any documentation regarding their pain. It was also determined that this physician was only present at the office approximately half the time he claimed, and that prescriptions for Schedule II opioids were being written for patients even while the physician was out of the country on vacation. The investigation also revealed that the nurses were seeing 20 to 30 patients a day and that their salaries were production-based, receiving a percentage of what they billed instead of a set salary. Additionally, these nurses were billing Medicare and TRICARE under the physician's NPI number, which resulted in an increased charge to the government for physician services. In all, this physician faces up to 20 years in federal prison. Now, mid-September also saw a pharmaceutical company agreeing to pay $7.9 million for allegedly causing Medicare to pay for invalid prescription drugs. The pharmaceutical company agreed to pay almost $8 million to resolve allegations that it caused the submission of false claims to Medicare Part D in violation of the False Claims Act for three generic drugs that were no longer eligible for Medicare coverage. FDA-approved prescription-only drugs may be dispensed only upon a prescription and are reimbursed by Medicare Part D, whereas over-the-counter or, or OTC drugs may be purchased by retail customers without a prescription and are not reimbursed by Medicare Part D. Subject to FDA approval, companies may seek to fully convert a brand-name prescription-only drug to an OTC drug. After FDA's approval of a drug's full conversion to OTC status, the drug is no longer considered a prescription-only product, and makers of generic equivalents are then required either to seek FDA approval for their own OTC switch or to seek a withdrawal of their generic prescription-only approval and cease marketing it. This pharmaceutical manufacturer has the following generic drugs. Number one, diclofenac, sodium 1%, which is a generic non-steroidal anti-inflammatory cream. The second generic drug is olopidine hydrochloride 0.1% and 0.2%, a generic antihistamine eye drop. And finally, the third generic drug is azelastine hydrochloride 0.15%, a generic antihistamine nasal spray. Now, the FDA approved a full prescription to OTC conversion of the brand names of diclofenac and olapidine in February of 2020 and for azelastine in June of 2021. The United States alleged that this pharmaceutical company submitted or caused to be submitted false claims to Medicare Part D in violation of the False Claims Act by continuing to sell the generics under the obsolete prescription-only labeling after the brand name drugs were converted to OTC products. As part of the settlement, the pharmaceutical company admitted and accepted responsibility for the following facts. They delayed seeking the required OTC conversions for the generics, even after learning that the brand name drugs for each had converted to OTC 
OTC status. In particular, they delayed the generics losing their prescription-only labeling because it believed that continuing to sell each as purportedly prescription-only would be more profitable for the company. Accordingly, they continued to sell newly manufactured units of the generics under their obsolete prescription-only labeling rather than beginning the process of converting these products to OTC or withdrawing their approval and ceasing their distribution. They did not apply to FDA for an OTC conversion of diclofenac until March 2021 or for Olapidine until January 2021. They eventually sought to withdraw its FDA approval for azelastine rather than convert it to OTC use, but did not do so until January 2022. FDA implemented this withdrawal in February 2022. The pharmaceutical company has been credited in this settlement under the Department of Justice's guidelines for taking disclosure cooperation, and remediation into account in False Claims Act cases in the Justice Manual, Section 4-4.112. Of course, there were also many, many of the usual suspects, like more opioids distributors, overprescribing, kickbacks, bribery schemes, more elder abuse cases, even more DME fraud, even more labs in the hot seat, and money laundering. But I wanted to pay particular attention yet again to another case involving electroacupuncture devices. Here, a chiropractic clinic and its owner agreed to pay $200,000 to resolve allegations that they violated the False Claims Act by improperly billing Medicare for services involving electroacupuncture devices. And according to the settlement agreement between the years July 2016 and March 2018, they billed Medicare for the implantation of neurostimulator devices, a surgical procedure during which devices are implanted into the central nervous system or targeted peripheral nerves. The United States contends that these bills falsely represented the services provided because they did not actually perform surgical procedures. Instead, a nurse practitioner allegedly applied electroacupuncture devices to patients' ears by inserting a limited number of needles and using an adhesive. Medicare does not pay for electroacupuncture devices billed as implantable neurostimulators and did not reimburse for acupuncture at all during the relevant time period. Now remember, there are many of these types of electroacupuncture devices out there. Common brand names include P-STEM, Stivax, NeuroStim, AnsiStim, ePulse, and NSS2 Bridge. But they are all topical devices. There is no surgery involved for the application of these devices because again, they are applied topically or on the surface of the skin. All right. Wow. What a doozy of a month. Wow. Lots of cases in the month of September. Such a mixed bag of cases as well that I highlighted here. But in my opinion, the cases involving the plastic surgeon, again, in my opinion, just reveals to me how much damage can be done with non compliance to incident two billings how much damage that can have on a practice. So let's remember, a physician must have seen the patient first and initiated the treatment plan and subsequently see the patient again from time to time throughout that course of treatment for that particular problem. Or how about that case I highlighted that involved the overprescribing family practice doc? In that case, too, the physician cannot be overseas vacationing, all the while it's the nurses or the other NPPs on staff that are seeing the office patients without, again, any direct supervision, because, again, that doctor was on vacation overseas. 
So remember, I do my very best each and every month trying to highlight those cases I find most interesting. I try my best to provide solid guidance and advice to providers to be mindful of correct coding and compliant billing practices to avoid joining these very serious, these very public, and often very, very hefty outcomes. I always believe these types of fraud, waste, and abuse cases are most helpful. So please take a deeper look into these reports and see how they may affect you, your practice, your facility. Start self-auditing your service claims and coordinating documentation to ensure you are meeting compliance. And now it's time for my best practice tips and trusty tip. So in today's compliance tip, I wanted to focus on the latest comparative billing report or CBR that's been issued on cataract surgery. It is CBR number 202208. That's right, it's the eighth CBR for the year for 2022. So right now, during the end of September, if you are a provider that's been affected, CMS has put this particular CBR in the mail this week. So again, it is comparative billing report, CBR number 202208. And it's going to be affecting rendering providers who have submitted Medicare Part B claims for cataract services that they provided. This CBR 202208 focuses on the current procedural terminology, that's our CPT codes, all of those codes that include 66982, 66983, and 66984. Now, this particular CBR analysis was based on claims extracted from the integrated data repository using the very latest version of claims available on July 21st, 2022. Now, the analysis includes claims with dates of service from January 1st of 2019 through December 31st of 2019, so one full year. Now, the 2021 Medicare Fee-for-Service Supplemental Improper Payment Data Report reflects an improper payment rate of 12.7% for eye procedures or cataract removals or lens insertions, which represents over $218 million in improper payments. That's a huge number, huge. Now, the types of error that comprise this improper payment rate for Medicare Part B eye procedures include, I hope we're all sitting, a whopping 87.2% of improper payment rate is attributed to insufficient documentation. Let me say that big number again. 87.2% is actually because of insufficient documentation. And then a little bit smaller, 12.8% is attributable to incorrect coding. Now, after review of and research into the improper payment rate, this CBR was created to analyze the possible threat to the Medicare Trust Fund associated with cataract surgery services. So the expectation is that our providers who provide cataract surgery services will maintain proper documentation for patient care and confirm correct coding processes. The criteria for receiving a CBR are that a provider is significantly higher compared to either their peer group or the national percentages in any of three metric calculations. Or another criteria for receiving the CBR is if the provider has had at least 30 total beneficiaries with claims that they've submitted for cataract surgery. And finally, third, if you receive this particular CBR, it is for the criteria that include that you as a provider have had at least $30,000 in total, in, excuse me, in total allowed charges for cataract surgeries. Now, the CPT codes involved here, again, like I mentioned above, are for 66982, 66983, 
and 66984. So let's dive into what those definitions are for each code. So CPT code 66982 is defined as extracapsular cataract removal with insertion of intraocular lens prosthesis. And it's a one-stage procedure, manual or mechanical technique. For example, irrigation and aspiration or phaco emulsification. Complex, requiring devices or techniques not generally used in routine cataract surgery. For example, iris expansion device, suture support for intraocular lens, or primary posterior capsulorexis, or performed on patients in the amblogenic developmental stage. Let's move on to CPT code 66983. CPT code 66983 is defined as intracapsular cataract extraction with insertion of intraocular lens prosthesis, one stage procedure. And finally, let's talk about CPT code 66984. CPT code 66984 is defined as extracapsular cataract removal with insertion of intraocular lens prosthesis, one stage procedure manual or mechanical technique, for example, irrigation and aspiration or phaco emulsification. So for example, I'm looking at the uh, CBR example that they have on file with Medicare. So for example, your letter will identify in a chart or in a table your particular individualized utilization for a specific time frame. Like, for example, your summary of your utilization of CPT codes for cataract surgery from January 1st of 2019 through December 31st of 2019 is for CPT codes 66982, 66983, and 66984. So this is the example CBR. For example, your allowed charges were $8,870 for 13 units of CPT code 66982 for 12 total patients in your practice. Then they provide another example of your allowed charges were $0 for zero units of CPT code 66983 for zero total patients in your practice. And their final example includes your allowed charges were $455,000 for 826 units of CPT code 66984 for a total of 457 patients in your practice. So again, that was only an example that they provide in the example CBR of what you can expect when you receive a letter. Now, the metrics that are involved here. So this particular CBR is an analysis of these following metrics. There are three of them. They divide this up into three things. First, the percent of cataract surgeries billed as a complex procedure. Remember, that was the first CPT code that I defined for you. The first one is for complex procedure in CPT code 66982. Now, the second metrics is for the percent of beneficiaries with a cataract surgery who have a subsequent secondary cataract surgery on the same eye performed by the same or different provider within 547 days. And finally, the third metric that they're looking at in this particular CBR is the percent of cataract surgeries where post-operative care was rendered by a different provider. Now, the CBR analysis focuses, again, on providers with specialty number 18 for ophthalmology. All subspecialties were excluded, so they're only looking at specialty number 18, ophthalmology. These are listed as the rendering providers on Medicare Part B claims for cataract surgery services. Now, they disclose that statistics were calculated for each provider, all providers in the state, and all providers in the nation. The state and national peer groups are defined as follows. The state group, 
is defined as all rendering Medicare providers practicing in the individual provider state or territory with allowed charges for the procedure codes included in this study. Now, they're defining the national peer group as all rendering Medicare providers in the nation with allowed charges for the procedure codes included in this study. Now, each provider's values are compared to his or her state peer group values, as well as to the national values. So then your metrics were compared to your state group, your sample peer group, and the nation. Now, there are four possible outcomes for the comparisons between the provider and his or her peer groups. So number one, that you are found to be significantly higher, which means your value is greater than or equal to the 90th percentile from the state group or the national mean. And then second, you were found to be higher, which means that you're a provider of value that is greater than the state group or the national mean. Or number three, your possible outcome could be does not exceed, which Medicare defines as you are the provider, your value is less than or equal to the state group or the national mean. And then finally, CMS has a fourth criteria as not applicable, which means that you are a provider that does not have sufficient data for any sort of CMS comparison. Now, CBR number 202208 summarizes, again, the statistics for services with dates of service from January 1, 2019 through December 31, 2019. And CMS discloses here that they found 10,079 providers nationwide that are listed as rendering providers on claims for cataract surgery services. Now, the total allowed charges for these claims were over $1 billion during the analysis timeframe. Now, remember that the cataract surgery has a vulnerability, right? That's why this CBR was performed. There's a vulnerability to the Medicare Trust Fund. Now, according to the 2021 Medicare Fee-for-Service Supplemental Improper Payment Data Report, again, an improper payment rate of 12.7% for eye procedures or cataract removal, lens insertions, which represents over $200 million in improper payments. And let me reiterate, those large percentages of improper payment are broken down further. 87.2% is identified as insufficient documentation was found. And 12.8% of improper payment rate is due to incorrect coding. So let's remember once again that this particular CBR is disclosing their desired behavior that they want for providers performing cataract surgery services. They want to protect the Medicare trust fund. They want to increase providers' awareness about the utilization of cataract surgery. They want to support providers' internal compliance processes. And finally, they want to provide coding guidelines and requirements. Now, remember, I've said this time and time again on my CBR reports that I issue in trustee tips from month to month when they're identified. It's critical to understand that the CBR does not indicate that you are going to get an official audit, but just listen to the percentages that I've given, right? All of the high volume of insufficient documentation alongside incorrect coding. So the inevitable is likely to happen. Fingers crossed, if you get corrective actions, compliant eyes in your practice, this will all be fine. So that's my small disclaimer, that it's critical to understand the CBR does not indicate that you're going to get an official audit. Although, please be mindful, this is a phrase directly coming from the MACs that issue the CBRs, right? So take that with lots of salt. More directly, consider this to be your notice, your warning that you most definitely are being looked at closely. But the value of the CBR to providers is huge. It definitely, definitely, definitely serves as a tool to look at your billing patterns as compared to your peers in your state, as well as across the country. The value is also huge in the facts 
that specific coding guidelines and billing information will be detailed, as I've stated. And I do have some more juicy facts of my own to provide. Now, this particular CBR informs providers whose billing patterns differ, excuse me, differ from those of their peers, right? So again, the desired behavior here is of course to capture proper and compliant documentation for these types of cataract surgery services, because these numbers are way too high, way too high of an error rate, in my opinion, at 87.2% of insufficient documentation and 12.8% due to incorrect coding. So best practice recommendations include review the CPT codes to ensure correct code assignment. You should be performing regular internal reviews of documentation and code selection to ensure accuracy and compliance. Now these two steps alone can definitely help reduce the possibility of improper payments. But again, I think I've stressed this plenty in this particular segment that it's insufficient documentation that's the killer here, right? So what documentation do I want to see when I'm auditing for ophthalmology services, specifically ophthalmological cataract surgeries? Now, I want to see if there's any Medicare local coverage determinations or articles or national coverage determinations that apply. Those are my first go-to things. I need to see policy. Now, I want to see that the documentation meets all the requirements for complex cataract surgeries. Like, did you know that the billing of CPT code 66982 is not related to the surgeon's perception of the surgical difficulty or the surgical complexity? The use of this code, however, is governed by the need to employ devices or techniques or tools that are not generally used in routine cataract surgery. So some indications for the use of the complex cataract surgery CPT code, again, that's our CPT code 66982 addressed in this CBR. Those indications include the use of tools or techniques to address a pupil that will not dilate sufficiently to allow adequate visualization of the lens, including some of these things, like if there's a need for iris retractors placed through additional incisions, or if there's a need for an expansion device, like a Beeler device or a ring, or if there's a need for a sector iridectomy with subsequent suture repair of the iris sphincter or if there's a need for sphincterotomies created with scissors or other tools, or if this happens to be a pediatric cataract surgery, or if there's a use of dye, for example, a tripan blue or an endocyanine green for visualization of the anterior capsule in the presence of a mature cataract, or if there's use of permanent sutures to fixate an intraocular lens, or if there's the use of a capsular tension ring or segments to allow for secure placement of an intraocular lens, or the simple facts that every complex cataract surgery must have a justification to meet the requirements of its CPT descriptor. So again, our clinical documentation has to state pretty clearly at the offset what the justification, what the medical necessity is for that complex cataract surgery. So it's strongly recommended to include that initial supporting statement in the operative note, right up there, up at the top. Just keep it bold, keep it clear, keep it concise, right up top. That's the recommendation in an article that they've written for these types of complex cataract surgeries. So indication for complex cataract surgery could be the patient required suturing a posterior chamber intraocular lens because of insufficient capsular support. Another example you could write is intraoperative iris hooks were required to address a severely meiotic pupil. Or another example, for the indication for the complex cataract surgery could be that you had to use the tripan blue dye 
was needed to adequately visualize the lens capsule in the presence of a mature cataract. So this particular CBR should have all of us performing cataract surgery services really buckle down and self audit whether we receive this CBR in the mail or not. It's a great time right now to dive deeper into your own data, help yourself, help the Medicare Trust Fund at the same time. You should be paying attention to what you are sending out the door. Is it really in compliance? So stay ahead of the curve and avoid receiving post-payment audits from the payers down the road. It's fundamental if you have Medicare as a payer to keep your eye on correct and compliant coding and billing practices and make sure you are adhering to all of them. It's so important to make sure clinical documentation addresses and captures all indications for coverage and medical necessity, and you avoid the whopping 87.2% of improper payment rate due to insufficient documentation, or 12.8% of this improper payment rate due to incorrect coding. So a better, smarter approach is one that's proactive and starts by painting a clear, rich, and vibrant medical picture the first time, so your certified medical coder can then abstract codes with accuracy. And finally, I focus season seven spark on purpose and impact. I want this seventh season spark to be filled with our world's thought leaders, writers, artists, philosophers, everyone who inspires the need for purpose and impact in all we strive to do. So, in this week's inspiring quote, in Spark, is from renowned primatologist and acclaimed anthropologist Jane Goodall. What you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. So very true, right? I think this is an amazing quote that reminds us that we need to identify our own purpose. What is it we're trying to achieve? What message are we sending out? Who are we wanting to reach? I think this quote reminds us that when we identify our own purpose, that is when we can make our greatest impact. We make our greatest impact not only to ourselves from within, but we also impact others. Our impact can be received by others as well. I am happy Jane Goodall's spark still shines on in all of us today. So that wraps up today's episode. And as always, I appreciate you all diving into today with me. If you want more information from me, please go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. Please have an amazing week ahead and remember to carve out time for yourself to unwind and play or to just be still. And of course, please continue staying safe and healthy. We're still living in a PHE status. And in today's final fun note, remember, like I stated in the beginning, go ahead and celebrate fall while you can. Take that autumn drive to the mountains, go apple picking, plan your hauntings and spooks for October, get those football tickets to that college game. I've got all of these on my lineup in the months ahead. And of course, I'll be heading to Paris as well for one of my very favorite conferences in the coming weeks. And of course, I lead you all on by saying Paris when really it's Las Vegas. The hotel is Paris, but I'm just gonna keep saying I'm going to Paris in a couple weeks, okay? I'm gonna keep myself happy and say I'm gonna go eat croissants in Paris. Thank you so much for listening in on today's episode. And I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday.